All right, everyone. Well, I have uh, two o'clock on my clock here, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome to the current webinar series, the North Central Region Water Network Speed Networking Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Ann Nardi, and I work with uh, UW-Madison Division of Extension and the North Central Region Water Network, and I'll be your facilitator for today's session. Uh, today's session is going to focus on water quality trading in action. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with the North Central Region Water Network, we are a 12-state extension-led collaboration working to empower water professionals and water leaders uh, to steward our water resources. Uh, we have this webinar monthly, and we call it a speed networking webinar series because we feature a range of different water topics, and uh, we feature those topics very quickly. So uh, we have two to three different speakers on our uh, topic of choice, and each is presenting for only 10 to 15 minutes, giving you an idea of what's going on uh, within the region on each of these water topics. So today we are excited to be featuring water quality trading, a topic that I know is of interest to a lot of folks. Um, and we have two great speakers lined up for you. Before we jump in, just a couple logistical items for you. So the first is that we're gonna have two speakers here today. Uh, they will each present, and then afterwards we will have a dedicated Q&A session. So make sure to put your, Q, your questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. It should look like a messaging app at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, and we will um, ask those questions that are the most popular first. So feel free to read through the existing questions, upvote any that you see and you might also have. Uh, we'll try to get as many as we can in um, the allotted time here that we have today. Uh, if you are experiencing any technical issues or if you did want to share links or introduce yourself with other folks on the call today, uh, feel free to do that in the chat. We keep the chat open for dialogue, uh, links, um, as well as any technical issues that come up. Um, so feel free to use the chat for that. And then the Q&A is for our questions for our presenters today. Um, if you don't put it in the Q&A, there's a chance it might get missed. So make sure to keep uh, your questions in that, um, using that icon. If you are experiencing any audio issues, you can use a phone-in option. Um, you can access that by uh, clicking the mute icon at the bottom of your screen, um, clicking up and then doing uh, switch to phone audio. Uh, this session is recorded. We uh, will post this uh, recording as well as the PowerPoint presentation slides, which our presenters were kind enough to uh, provide on northcentralwater.org. Uh, you can go to northcentralwater.org backslash media archive and access all of our webinars from the past, uh, let's see, uh, nine years uh, on there. Um, so feel free to to look on there as well as um, look on our homepage for uh, this session, a recording of this session in the next day or two. All right, so let's dive in. I mentioned we're going to be talking about water quality trading. I think uh, most water professionals are aware of the concept of water quality trading and of using market-based approaches that can be a win-win-win for not only municipalities and point sources, but also uh, for agricultural landowners and for water quality and reading water quality roles. Um, but I think there is some thought in terms of how much is it actually happening across the region, uh, what needs to be in place to make it happen. So I'm excited to have two great presenters here to talk about that. Uh, first up is Todd Peterson, a uh, consultant with the Sand County Foundation, who's going to be talking about his work across the region and in Iowa to get water quality training uh, in in, the, um, in action there. Um, and next is Matt um, Flory. Uh, he is with Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and, and he's really gonna be talking about Wisconsin specifically and their uh, water quality program, uh, which is quite successful here, as well as the new uh, clearinghouse that was uh, created last year on water quality projects. So first up is Todd, I mentioned Todd. Uh, works with the Sand County Foundation and works across the region, um, but um, concentrates in Iowa on strengthening water quality partnerships. Um, so I won't read his full uh, bio there, but you can um, see that much of his career has been spent, you know, working with producers um, to uh, 
to improve the water quality and the environment. And he's clearly got a, a lovely dog there as well. So with that, I will stop sharing and uh, hand it over to you, Todd. Okay, welcome everyone. This worked just a second ago. Okay. All right, why am I locked up, Ann? I'm not sure. Uh, the bottom of your screen, you don't see a share screen option. I might have to close this PowerPoint. Okay, try that. If not, I can share your screen, your slides for you. Um, okay. Hmm. Well, this worked just seconds ago. Ann, why don't you share my slides? Yeah, not a problem. I can't get out of here. All right, there you go, Todd. Uh, feel free just to, to um, tell me to advance when you're ready. So I'm part of the Sand County Foundation. That's an, an organization uh, in Aldo Leopold's legacy. Uh, I also want to mention my sister organization, the Environmental Policy Innovation Center, EPIC. Uh, they've worked primarily on accelerating uh, conservation through policy options. So they're going to be crucial in, in expanding this trading concept. Uh, next slide, please. I don't know what's going on here. I can't seem to close PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so Aldo Leopold wrote, as many of you know, about uh, the importance of uh, conservation on private land and then essentially introduced the concept of the land ethic and uh, our obligation to uh, be caretakers of, uh, of the land that we uh, control and, and operate on. So next slide. Um, this probably isn't even needed in, in this crowd, but um, obviously we want more people thinking on a watershed scale. And typically we have, uh, we've worked to connect people in cities and urban residents with the fact that they are part of a watershed. And um, much of our work in my work is to try to figure out how to make stronger partnerships between urban residents and their watershed farmers and landowners. Uh, next slide. Why Iowa? Well, we are working in, in, I mean, we are a national organization, but we're focusing on Iowa because we uh, do contribute about a third of the nutrients going down the Mississippi. Um, our state has um, uh, about 90 to 95% of the nitrogen and phosphorus in our surface water is from agricultural systems. We're an ag dominated state, obviously. Um, as we all understand, the, the uh, Clean Water Act is 50 years old, but it specifically called agricultural uh, nutrient loss is a non-point source, which is not regulated. The state really only has uh, the capacity to regulate point sources, even though less than 5% of our nutrients come from point sources in, in Iowa. Um, so we are, uh, an egg state that um, we need to figure out how to clean up our surface waters. Next slide. We've uh, had this concept going on for a couple of years now in this state, and I was brought on almost two years ago to talk about how can communities work upstream with farmers and landowners in their watershed and get credit basically. If they can do something promote conservation, introduce practices that reduce the nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment in the water. Basically a city 
or a discharge permit holder can get credit for that. That's what we're talking about. Next. Um, kind of a poster child for this project was uh, Cedar Rapids in 2008. The downtown flooded for several weeks and they uh, also flooded their sewage treatment plant as well as their water plant. And after the flood receded, the city leaders were wise and said, you know, how are we gonna fix this? How are we gonna prevent this from happening again? Um, one option was to build higher levees, but everybody realized that was sort of a, a band-aid on the, and not fixing the problem. So the, the wisdom of the leaders that said, let's go upstream and pay landowners to keep rain where it falls. And after really only a few years of, of doing so, they started noticing that the water quality coming into town was improved and they were spending less money to treat the water because they were essentially protecting the source and, and delivering cleaner water to the city. And so it seemed like a win-win situation to work up in the watershed. Next. Um, we do and encourage all kinds of conservation, edge of field as well as infield practices, but clearly, um, as we build soil health through soil health practices, less tillage, cover crops, and as we implement either oxbow restoration, edge of field practices, um, saturated buffers and bioreactors, we're doing a lot to uh, basically keep the rain where it falls, as I said earlier, and slow that influx of, of uh, rain and runoff from large rainfall events. Next. So how does this work? Um, I look over to the right side of, of your screen or my screen. Um, initially, we helped negotiate an agreement with the state agencies uh, called a memorandum of understanding. And the discharge permit holder and us work together to propose a, a mem basically it's a plan that if the city chooses to do work in their watershed, here's how they might earn credits and, um, and have them validated. So after we have an agreement in place, and I'll take, talk a little bit more about this memorandum of understanding, uh, we basically can then work with local conservation groups, whether that's a watershed management authority or other watershed groups or state agencies or federal agencies, but we have city resources to encourage and, and accelerate the use of these uh, cost-effective uh, conservation practices in field or edge of field, but we also have a, a science-based model. We're currently using the nutrient tracking tool to uh, evaluate how many pounds of nitrogen and how many pounds of phosphorus and how many pounds of sediment could we avoid by adopting that practice. And then um, those credits are applied for by the permit holder and they're earned and, and awarded based on um, that, you know, sanctions against the, the permit. So what's happening right now in Iowa is, is we have a nutrient reduction strategy and many cities are not meeting their new targets under the nutrient reduction strategy. So they're looking for options. And ideally they're hoping to avoid or delay or defer expensive upgrades to their wastewater treatment plant. And if there's a way that they can do that by doing watershed work, we basically get an inexpensive ways to, uh, to reduce the nutrients in the water, as well as um, avoid costly upgrades to the plant. Now that may not be obviating the need for the new plant, but at least delay it. Um, it's likely the requirements for wastewater treatment are gonna be changing sometime in the near future. And so we hate to see cities spending tens of millions of dollars building new plants right now that meet today's regulations knowing that they're likely to change in the near future. So this is a way, it's an option for cities to basically get some flexibility around meeting regulatory compliance and actually improving water quality for all. Next. This is a, an example of a memorandum of understanding. It basically just lays out what would we do if we did do watershed work, if the city contributed resources to encourage conservation upstream in their watershed, how could we um, basically get credit for that and how, how would the credits be validated? Next. So the memorandum of understanding um, is 
basically giving some cities uh, flexibility and options in how are they going to comply. Um, it's a pay for performance. And there is an option if cities don't want to take this on on their own. There is a soil and water outcomes fund that is a player and it, it works across the region too. It's expanding to other states. You probably know about that, but that's uh, um, co-located at the Iowa Soybean Association. And um, they're actively selling outcomes now. And it, it's kind of, I tell cities that it's, it's kind of training wheels. If you wanna get started in doing watershed work, here are some folks that can help you get started. But some cities are proved, uh, deciding to take this on in their own and establishing and encouraging and funding some of the local watershed efforts around the state. Next. So again, this uh, agreement provides an, uh, guidelines on how uh, these credits could be earned and validated and then even utilized. Um, the, uh, we currently have about 10 cities that we've signed um, MOUs with, and um, the, uh, our regulatory agency, in our case in Iowa, it's a DNR, are working on ways to uh, smooth and facilitate essentially the validation of those credits. Uh, so uh, it's been a work in progress, but the system is up and running, and uh, we're anxious to um, continue to make progress with more cities coming on board all the time. Next slide. Um, there are some practices in, in urban areas. This is in uh, Dubuque, Iowa. They've uh, done some work on restoring a, a creek that formerly went through a culvert down to the Mississippi, and now it's uh, it's it's resunlighted. And um, there's some other communities in Iowa that are trying to uh, earn credits for some urban projects that also enhance water quality, um, some wetlands restoration, uh, some works in parks, and um, even some work on, on city-owned facilities and turf. If there's a way that we can document and model uh, you know, improvements in water quality or reduction in, in nutrient loading through some of the urban or uh, recreation ground enhancements, uh, there's ways that, that cities can get credit again against their discharge permit. Next. So if this was pointed out by our policy uh, sister organization, as I mentioned, um, we already have a market-based solution option in the, the current farm bill. Uh, we don't need to change anything. There are incentives already established and, and we'll hear about the Wisconsin example now. Um, but this is already already in code, and we're hoping that some of the things will strengthen that in this next farm bill to provide market-based offset trading and, um, and um, enable, again, enable cities to meet their regulatory requirements through watershed work. Next. There's my contact information um, and a website if you want to learn more about our uh, municipal ag watershed partnership program. So I think that was about 10 minutes and we'll talk, have questions later on. Great, thank you so much, Todd. We already have a few questions coming in. Um, so uh, feel free to put your, your questions for Todd in, in the chat. Bear with me while I switch over here. All right, so uh, moving along, our next speaker is uh, Matt Chorty. Uh, Matt is a phosphorus implementation coordinator with the Wisconsin DNR. Um, and Wisconsin is really a state that I think is leading the way when it comes to water quality training. So excited to hear about a uh, robust program already in place. And Matt is helping to, to coordinate that and what we all can learn from that in terms of what we can do in our parts of the region. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Matt. I will unmute. All right, thank you, Anne. So we'll throw the visuals up on the screen. Looks great. All right, excellent. So, Yes, water quality trading in Wisconsin. I should first provide the disclaimer that, you know, while I make uh, statements about trading in general, you know, these are really 
based on experiences from Wisconsin. So trading may look different uh, in, in other states, depending on the, the regulatory landscape uh, there. So, um, you know, I, I think that's important to uh, get out of the way uh, first. Uh, with that, we'll dive in. So if you navigate to DNR's website, uh, you'll you know, find our water quality trading page and note that, yeah, we've got 57 wastewater facilities that have fully established trades. They're complying with regulatory requirements via trading. We have eight uh, developing trades right now, and that entails about 40,000 pounds per year of nonpoint phosphorus offsets. Uh, in, indeed, most of those efforts are, you know, focused on nonpoint uh, phosphorus contributions to surface waters. And then looking forward, we have uh, a water quality trading clearinghouse established uh, in state statute and uh, an organization on the ground doing some good work. And with great potential in the future of 100 to 200 or more facilities jumping on board with the water quality trading uh, project. So uh, in this presentation, I want to cover how we got here uh, to this point with our trading program and then uh, where we are headed next. Uh, in the state with regards to trading. So I'll back up just a second, uh, provide a little regulatory background for those of you not in the regulatory sphere. All comes back to the Clean Water Act. And those responsibilities are delegated from EPA down to states. Most states have a program. Uh, in Iowa, you have Iowa DNR, Minnesota, MPCA. Uh, over in Michigan, it's Eagle and uh, you know, it, so that, that's us uh, at Wisconsin DNR, uh, where we are tasked with these three key precepts of water quality protection. So we're assessing water bodies and assigning designated uses. We're setting water quality standards to protect those uses. And then our regulatory system regulates pollutant discharges uh, through an NPDES framework. Uh, to maintain or achieve those water quality standards. So you can see our org chart, very small there. We've got 60 to 70 employees all pulling for this uh, at the state level. Uh, we handle a myriad of different issues from industrial waste, land spreading, to uh, pretreatment, to operator certification. So there's, there's a whole lot of work going on here behind the scenes, all things wastewater in the state. We have uh, various offices across the state uh, we're broken down into five regions um, and uh, do our work from there. So of course, nutrient pollution is one of our state's most challenging issues. And in fact, it's Midwest's most one of Midwest's most challenging issues. So many of you in the North Central region are, are probably seeing some of the same impacts that we're seeing in, in Wisconsin. Uh, back in the 2000s, things got pretty heated uh, with public outcry due to algal blooms on lakes, uh, nuisance aquatic plant growth, rivers choked with vegetation, uh, and, and generally degraded biological communities. So uh, multiple environmental organizations came together, threatened a federal lawsuit. Um, you know, there was some pretty serious communication between EPA and DNR at that time. Uh, those actions, amongst others, led DNR to adopt surface water quality standards for phosphorus in 2010, which is a big step. Uh, these numbers are legally required uh, to be achieved in, in our streams through our permitting system now. Uh, you can see you know, each water gets its own number based on how much phosphorus can be in the water uh, without seeing negative impacts. There's a lot of good scientific background that I won't go into. USGS did some very detailed studies at about 250 different sites across the state to support these numbers. Uh, they looked at a breakpoint analysis to determine at what phosphorus concentration things start to head south with regards to um, algal conditions or um, you know macroinvertebrate communities, things like that. Uh, for our lakes, we borrowed a lot from Minnesota. Thank you, Minnesota. And once these standards are on the books, that means we have to permit based on you know, protection of those standards. So many of our wastewater plants get very low phosphorus limits. They're, they're in most water bodies is not 
assimilative capacity for additional phosphorus. So the limit is set equal to the criterion, which more or less means facilities have to uh, filter their effluent. Uh, in order to meet those those limits, you can see the map there. You know this is all across the state. We have 750 uh, permitted uh, wastewater dischargers. Those are municipal plants as well as industrial plants like cheese producers, paper plants, uh, things of that nature. Uh, in in many, you know, about half received an ultra low limit, and another quarter received a you know a lower yet limit than than was ever assi previously assigned. So what this means for technology required to add our wastewater plants is you're going from uh, traditional treatment that can be typically done in clarifiers and um, you, you know uh, oxidation ditches like shown in the left there. I think that's Milwaukee's wastewater plant to a intensive filtration process. We're actually running that wastewater through a filter uh, to get the solids out of it very clean water discharged. It, it's a very good thing to do. Uh, there's indications that it pulls mercury with it too and, and other sorts of pollutants. So um, it's very expensive though. And following the adoption of our standards, we had an economic impact analysis conducted. And it, you know, just some broad takeaways here from that was we're looking at doubling or tripling the sewer rates of many communities. So, you know, many users pay $50 a month for sewer service. After you install, you know, after your plant is upgraded, those costs come through to you. Yeah, you're looking at $100 to $150 a month. Uh, small Wisconsin communities that, you know, that, that can signal bad news for, you know, future growth and, and things like that. And then many industries, you know, there's additional costs there, you know, they may be forced to close, relocate or, or scale back with cascading impacts through the economy. So of course, we, we have to have flexibility around this regulation if um, you know, we're, we're not to have some cataclysmic uh, overturn of our standards. <laughs> um, and water quality trading is, is just one of those. Adaptive management is similar. Uh, and, and then we also have uh, lots of variance options when that economic hardship uh, is, is able to be demonstrated. But um, to, to focus in a little bit on, on the trading option, it, it has really created an ecosystem services marketplace with all of these facilities now having a phosphorus requirement that is very expensive. Um, so we have a very strong driver for water quality trading uh, in the state. And we, we get into the simple economics of how much is a pound of phosphorus worth kept out of our surface waters. And we look at non-point sources of phosphorus as the low-hanging fruit there, um, typically $20 to $50 a pound for on-farm practices, rather than $500 to $1,500 a pound for uh, wastewater upgrades. Uh, we have modeling technology now that can uh, quantify non-point reductions uh, fairly accurately. Uh, you know, SNAP Plus is, is, our, is our NTT in the state, uh, developed by uh, UW-Madison Soil Science Department, hats off to them, uh, for, for the mechanistic model based on Russell 2 um, that a lot of our agronomists use uh, already in the state. Our trading program has been built into that model as well for, you know, quick, quick and accurate um, uh, credit quantification. Uh, other models as well uh, can, can certainly be used if you're looking at barnyards or uh, you know, stormwater, things of that nature. And we do allow a pretty wide array of practices uh, to be used for water quality trading in the state. Um, pretty much anything goes as long as it's quantifiable and you can really define what's being done on, on a field to, to reduce um, the, the runoff and, and quantifiable in terms of it meets modeling assumptions, right? So it's, that's something we have to look at. Uh, trade ratios come into play because these are non-point offsets that rely on precipitation to generate a reduction. You know, that, that's a little different than a wastewater pipe that's continually discharging. So trade ratios range from 1.2 to one at a minimum, four to one for practices that are less certain or shown to be less effective. Uh, when water quality trades are established, the annual inspections are required, uh, permittee self-report, 
DNR can audit those on the ground. And we have to look at you know, credit thresholds in terms of what would have been required absent the trade. So if there's a TMDL, there's a level of pollution control that's already required before you can generate credits. Uh, same with other permits like a stormwater permit. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, we, uh, if there's a pre-existing practice, um, you know, that's typically not eligible because we're looking for an additional offset caused by a permittee. Uh, all of this work is captured in a facility-specific water quality trading plan, usually authored by uh, the, the city itself or their consultant. Uh, sometimes our county land conservation departments pitch in and, and help with these. And the intent of these water quality trading plans is to really lay out what's being done uh, at, a, at a specific you know, field scale um, uh, resolution to define you know, what practices are going in, what the modeling inputs and results were for those non-point reductions, the location, timeline, uh, what will be done to maintain those practices. So, uh, you know, very detailed documents. Uh, DNR staff review these documents, uh, verify uh, once, once everything's approvable. And then the water quality trading plan is referenced in the credit user's discharge permit. So it becomes a permit requirement that everything that was laid out in the water quality trading plan for establishment of non-point practices uh, actually happen or the facility is not in compliance with, with their permit. And then we always public notice the water quality trading plans along with the discharge permits so that you know, we try to keep things very transparent. We want people to know what's being done to offset the pollution. Uh, EPA can review these and object. The public can review these and object. I mean, this, you know, this, this is something that everyone has to agree on is, is being valid. Uh, there are some pitfalls to trading. You know, I, I think it's important to be realistic uh, about the system. So shifting of pollutant loads. I, I've kind of organized these as, you know, for, you know, water quality concerns on one side and, and uh, participants concerns on the other side. So it, just to go through them really quick, shifting of pollutant loads, it can be a big deal. So, you know, a clear example here is, let's say my trade is to reduce manure application on a 20 acre field. Great, you know, that can improve water quality, but it begs the question, well, where, where is that manure going now? Are you just shifting it over to the adjacent 20 acre field, increasing pollutant load there? That's not a good deal environmentally for a trade, right? Uh, sometimes we see incorrect modeling inputs. You can, you know, just select one drop down box in Snap Plus differently, and it changes your credit uh, calculations pretty substantially. Uh, tillage type, for example, you know, we've had some uh, folks say, "Well, yeah, these fields are being moldboard plowed." And we, we look at the field and we say, no, no one moldboard plows anymore. It's, it's not, a, uh, not a common practice. Are they really moldboard plowing here? Maybe it's less intensive tillage. By and large, you know, every, everyone is ante up and up. But sometimes errors come through the, the process. Uh, and then the additionality of the program it is, is also something to look at. I mean, are, these are offsets. Are they actually being caused by the dischargers or is it something it, that was already taking place anyways on the landscape. Um, and then for the participants, there have been a number of challenges as well. So when you get into you know, committing to a trade, if you have a labor shortage, a material shortage, costs can go up. If you have inexperienced folks working on the stuff, uh, costs can go up. It's difficult to find trading partners. Um, you know, knocking on farmers' doors is, is challenging, uh, striking deals, challenging stuff. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's some hesitancy to spend the facility's money outside the, the fence of the facility, right, on, on this thing in the watershed that's not as uh, tangible. So the water quality trading clearinghouse concept was brought in uh, through some legislation, Act 151, several years ago, to create a third party that would come in and, and more or less stand up uh, the marketplace and provide predictability. So they're tasked with um, you know, entering into credit generating deals as well as selling those credits, and, and they, they can handle the legwork. Uh, over time, we're expecting this to result in much more uh, predictable, low-risk trades. Um, and then it gives a place for our credit 
generators, uh, you know, landowners, farmers to go to to say, hey, I've got a project shovel ready. I just need some funding. So uh, we received an excellent proposal from Res Resource Environmental Solutions. They're they're a large restoration company that works across the country. Um, they purchased uh, Applied Ecological Services in, in Broadhead, so they have a Wisconsin office now. And um, they, they brought in a lot of partners, demonstrated that they would have a, a, a strong clearinghouse. So uh, they were selected through a competitive process, Wisconsin Clearinghouse LLC. They have a fantastic website. You can check them out. And there's a, a portal where you can sign in create an account, you can see where credits are available, you can propose credit generating projects. So fairly slick process. Um, final thoughts. So we can kind of some key takeaway points here. I know I'm a little over time. Who is doing the work is really important when it comes to trading. Um, you, you know, if, if those folks are going through learning curves or, you know, have misconceptions about needs on, on any end of the deal, uh, you know, that, that can cost that can take time to work through. Uh, we've seen that regulations are important for driving trading activity. I, I, so there, we would have some upstanding communities, yes, voluntarily pursuing this without the phosphorus standards, um, but, but those would be, you know, several, count them on one hand, not a, a statewide um, thing. Uh, trading is not really a silver bullet for restoring our waterways. Only 18% of our phosphorus load in surface waters, more or less, uh, it's based on modeling, of course, is from point sources. You can't really ask them to offset more than about 18%. So, so I mean, really, when it comes to achieving those standards, it, it's going to come down to non-point and ag implementation more broadly. But trading is a powerful tool in the toolbox as far as if you're a non-point practitioner, you want to address a site, you know, trading may be an excellent opportunity. And then if you apply the same lens to all sources of pollutant, it, I think it's a really good educational uh, exercise for everybody. We see, wow, this highly impactful barnyard uh, upstream from the city is contributing 400 pounds of phosphorus per year. Well, that's how much our little wastewater plant contributes, but we're serving, you know, for uh, you know, we're serving 4,000 people. So it's, it's, a, it's a societal values question of, you know, how we are administering the assimilative capacity of our waterways. So uh, with that, I will um, concede uh, and turn it over to Anne. Thanks so much, Matt. I really appreciate that. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna, Bryn Breck and Todd here, we have a lot of questions from folks, which is great. I think um, that reflects just the variety of knowledge people have on water quality trading. Again, not surprisingly, because in some areas it's very common and in some areas it's not. So let's dive into the details here because we have quite a few questions and we'll see how many we can get through. Um, so one question that a lot of folks had um, and I think both Matt and Todd, you could speak to this. And I, Matt, you referenced it very quickly. It's just curious how long credits apply. For example, if a BMP that's installed has a working life of 10 years, do you get credited for all 10 years for uh, that uh, practice? Are you required to validate models each year? I'll say in Iowa, they're annual credits. Uh, you basically, if you change a practice in a field or add a, a edge field structure, you can apply for that credit uh, every year. And I guess we don't have any structures that have worn out yet, so I'm not sure. We do have a science advisory committee to advise uh, the validation of these credits. Um, I'm not sure that we've had to deal with uh, like bioreactors, um, you know, becoming dated and um, but right now we're, we're on an annual basis and our trade ratio is one to one which is very generous compared to other states in their uh, offset trading programs yeah absolutely yeah and and Todd you mentioned a credit is is for a year so I, that reigns true in Wisconsin too it you know we work in pound per year increments so you know that practice on the landscape for a year gives you that that number um you know that said, a practice can be on the landscape multiple years in a row. And while some, some practices may have a, a design life, um, 
we we've typically had to not not put a limit on it uh with with like a specific like 10 years is all you're going to get because you know all the wastewater plants want like 20 to 30 years of of compliance guaranteed from their investment right so part of it is to sell trading it's got to be somewhat permanent um but but also, uh, you know, I, th I think these are so important to the facilities that the maintenance of whatever practice it is, is going to help extend those design lives and, and potentially bring it into the 20 or 30 year range. Let, let me add that um, the process in Iowa is so new that we actually haven't had any credits traded yet. Um, but the cities that are interested in it Many times they're actually meeting their numbers, but they are looking for some insurance. You know, if they have a special event or if they bring a new employer, you mentioned a new employer to town um, that provides uh, this, this plant organic waste, you know, these cities are not going to be able to handle it. So it becomes an economic development um, issue for some of these towns that are losing population and uh, they have aging facilities and they just really can't afford to spend 30 plus million dollars on a new plant. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a question from Matt for Matt. Um, so, and I think it speaks a little bit to uh, Wisconsin and how we do things here, which may be different from other states. So how do you know that the modeled results are actually being achieved and how do you adjust if they aren't? So the, the water quality trading plan needs to lay out all the parameters of the practice that, that will be, you know, adhered to throughout, throughout the time frame. And, and we check to make sure that those parameters, you know, be it a buffer width or a vegetation coverage percentage, uh, th things like that, are um, a requirement of the maintenance and, and are looked at in the inspection. So... You know, we, we ensure that everything um, that is input to the model actually happens. Now, as far as actual water quality outcomes, we know that's going to vary quite significantly depending on precipitation. So that side of things would take monitoring to, to verify. And, and we do not monitor uh, in stream. We, a couple of projects may do it optionally, but um, it's not a program requirement. Great, thanks. Uh, Sujata is curious uh, what the pollutants that have been most successful in your you know, experience, obviously Matt, you're dealing with phosphorus. Uh, I think they're curious and specifically if there's been any success with temperature trading, you know, is it, it y'all, have you seen it outside, I guess, of nitrogen and phosphorus? We, we don't do it in, in Wisconsin for, for temperature. I, I know out West, they, there's some temperature trading um, so it's not unheard of, but uh, no, and uh, uh, TSS is, is another one, total suspended solids that, that kind of comes along with the phosphorus. Um, nitrogen, potentially, if we have standards one day that creates that driver, like I talked about, nitrogen may be important, though harder probably to quantify. Uh, we've had folks want to trade things like PFAS. Yeah, you can't trade toxics. Um, yeah. That's a, a federal requirement. And in Iowa, our main target is nitrogen and phosphorus. I mean, phosphorus is more important for lakes, but um, yeah, we're, we're uh, contributing, like I said, roughly a third of the nutrients that go down the Mississippi are from our state and, and we have to do a better job. Yeah, and certainly nitrogen comes in when we're talking drinking water. Uh, Ed is curious, uh, this question is for Matt. So Matt, of the you know forty thousand pounds of total phosphorus as a non-point source, is it all ag, or is there a small point coming from non-ag, non-point source? Um, I think he's looking for for that kind. Of, if you have that kind of number off the top of your head for Wisconsin in terms of total phosphorus. Yeah, that's that's good to ask that breakdown. I don't have a number. I should have spent more time on the practice types uh, slide. Uh, it, it said that we have 11% of our trades are focused on urban stormwater. So it, there is a smaller portion that's urban stormwater. And um, you know, some of it's also stream bank stabilization, which 
can can be chalked up to ag, some not um, ag, right? So uh, a smaller portion, not ag. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I don't know that number either, um, but that is an interesting question, ag. Ed, excuse me. Okay. Um, Greg is curious, uh, can trading credits piggyback off other funding sources for practices like EQIP, EQIP or private carbon credit or state cost shares? This probably absolutely for, for our, both of you, Todd, when you're scoping it out in Iowa. Yeah, in our case, absolutely. In fact, all of the cities that have participated in this program have been able to leverage other sources and uh, really grow the, the total pot for conservation in their watershed quite a bit. Um, a quick story about the city of Ames, uh, the public works director asked the city council for $100,000 to start this uh, uh, watershed work. And the city council said, here's 200,000 and you better spend it well because we expect you to come back and ask for more. So, and they've been able to leverage that into other grants, federal and state dollars uh, to, uh, I think they're at nearly a million dollars now um, in spending in their watershed. And it's, it's proving to be a very cost-effective way to clean up the, the rivers. In, in Wisconsin, everyone asks, and, and we always say, go ask your funder. We, we don't have any specific prohibitions on funding sources. We wanna be flexible. Uh, we know that federal 319 funds cannot be used to fund point source compliance. So that it's one thing we can, you know, make clear up front. Um, you, you know, if you fund a trade, th there is a pollutant increase associated with it. So um, if your intent is to improve water quality with those funds, you may not be all that effective because the credits allow an increase in pollution, more or less a wash, right? So um, it's something to keep in mind uh, for, for funding sources and talking to funders about trading. You're on mute. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I hadn't thought about it that way. And <laughs> thanks, Todd. Um, let's see here. Um, so, oh, and Marco just notes that Clean Water Services in Portland, Oregon has developed temperature offsets. So thanks, Marco, for that, uh, noting where there are some temperature offsets. Um, Mark uh, has a question for Matt. Would you briefly explain the importance of water quality trading for industry in Wisconsin? You did mention industry, you know, given that you're often bumping up against reserve capacity in many receiving waters. Yes, it's trading is looked on very looked at very fondly from our, our cheese industry, our paper industries. Um, uh, we have other industries I should be able to think of, um, but uh, they, uh, it, you know, they are faced with these compliance costs too that threaten their profitability as a business. So uh, if if they can comply with lower costs, uh, that's fantastic. Um, if you know, for for them, it can mean means they can maintain their their business, and then um, you know, a lot of these agricultural based industries like uh, cheese manufacturers have a land base that they, you know, they work with farmers directly for, for their milk supply. So um, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a straightforward solution for them to work with their local ag partners to, to obtain some credits in, in those cases. Uh, you mentioned TMDLs. Uh, once a TMDL for phosphorus is established, it kind of becomes a cap and trade system where a new discharger um, you know, may get some reserve capacity, but that may not be enough. So trading helps allow new discharges uh, as, as well if they can establish that offset uh, before they start discharging. Great, thanks. Uh, Heather Martin has a question, I think would probably be for both of y'all, um, you know, Matt more in practice, but Todd, how are y'all approaching this in Iowa and other states? Um, have you had any challenges with a farmer or other group not following through with the agreement or not fully meeting the requirements of the trade with the discharger? You know, like what happens then? I'll, I'll let Todd go first if there's any. Um, I think when it gets down to the farmer slash landowner level, uh, you know, it's voluntary compliance, whether they want to participate in it. And typically we do leverage other sources of funds to provide incentives to, um, uh, to implement the practice, whether it's edge of field or on infield. Um, 
Yeah, there's other kinds of headwinds, definitely. Um, you know, we, we have uh, a long history in Iowa of uh, maintaining and protecting the status quo. So um, if something looks uh, too authoritarian, it, it becomes a, a negative. Um, no one's gonna tell me what to do. I'm gonna be able to do what I want. But if you come in with the right kind of incentive, and we have several, I'm sure you've heard about batch and build programs. Um, we have uh, some innovations that are really accelerating the adoption of these practices. And for the most part, it, it's, uh, it's profitable, it's good for the farmer and it, it helps connect. In my case, we also wanna connect urban dwellers to their watershed. You are a part of the watershed and you should be concerned. I didn't mention flooding much, but uh, flooding and flood damage mitigation is we get warmer and wetter and we have fewer but larger rainfall events. Um, suddenly uh, the cities along rivers are saying, hey, we better do something because if that happens in our watershed, we're vulnerable to losing infrastructure. So sometimes it's not water quality that motivates the city to get involved in these uh, MOUs and, and promoting conservation. It's, it's really flood damage. Yeah, and, and I'll just say on Wisconsin side, we, we've had some trades go south where the, you know, the landscape that we, we found at the inspection was different than what was claimed to occur and generate credits. Uh, in those cases, the facility receives a notice of noncompliance. We start the enforcement process and, and they're asked to you know, remedy the, the site or you know, they also have the option to find credits elsewhere as, as well. Um, I, I'm glad Todd mentioned the, the like heavy-handed perception um, thing. You, you know, we we acknowledge trading's a new program, so we are, you know, we use of enforcement discretion accordingly. Given that, you know, a lot of this is is somewhat out of the control of the wastewater plants that use the credits. So, um, you know, while we may issue an NON. I'd say it's very unlikely at this point that we would be issuing like heavy fines or, you know, referrals to Department of Justice that, you know, unless we had some very nefarious things going on, you know, we, we just want to make sure the, the issues attended to and resolved and, um, you know, permit compliance is achieved. We have a law in Iowa that says the state cannot enforce a, a regulation or an implementation that the municipality cannot afford. So it's been standard practice for cities to hire a engineering consulting firm that says, yep, they're polluting too much, but they can't afford to fix it. And then they get another you know, pass. Well, the regional EPA, region five EPA is coming back in and saying, you know, you can't just keep kicking the can. Um, at some point, I wanna see progress here. So that is further motivation for the municipality or permit holder to say, okay, what other options do I have? Um, my engineer says I need to build a new plant, but you know our old plant was never designed to take nutrients out. Are there other options that are more cost effective? So uh, I, I say a number of cities are sitting on the sidelines watching these early adopters, the early signers say, okay, is that gonna work? And is, is that an option for us? Um, I'll say another thing is it's difficult for city leaders to sometimes say, why should I spend money outside our border why should we pay farmers to not pollute? They shouldn't be doing that anyway. So in some cases, it's, it's a bit of a mind shift that uh, occurs before the cities decide to, to wholeheartedly endorse this process. But those that have, have been very happy with the, with the outcome. Besides a few challenges, I, I mentioned it was difficult for the DNR to figure out how to validate these credits. If you apply for this credit, does that mean we have to run the models ourselves and see if we come up with the same numbers or there, there is a backlog of credit applications sitting at the DNR right now. And we're hoping to break that log jam shortly to, to show that these credits are real and they're benefiting the cities that, that applied for them. Yeah, thanks Todd for that. Um, so I think this leads really great to our next question from Sandy. You know, asking, you know, if they don't have a lot of water quality trading in their area, like theoretically does, water quality trading just mean that the point source can still pollute because they're buying non-point source reduction. Um, and Haley kind of follows up on that is, you know, does the point source have to improve their plan over time to continue as is? 
Um, so talk a little bit about like in theory, and I'm sure Scott, uh, Todd, you have a lot of experience with this as you're pitching it to municipalities and others. You know, how does that work in theory um, in terms of when you're getting that response from folks or because I think it is a, is a valid thought when you're first approached with this concept. Well, I need to make sure that we don't say this is uh, this is instead of a plant upgrade eventually most of this infrastructure is gonna to need to be upgraded. And we've got PFAS, we've got pharmaceuticals coming and the, the concept of treating wastewater right now is definitely gonna get more expensive and more complicated. But what our program allows them to do is to meet current requirements and maybe delaying uh, a major investment. The other thing that has to happen is that we have too many small towns that think they have to have their own we're going to have to promote more regional wastewater treatment too. It's just, um, it's been cheaper for every little small town and city to have their own plant now, but it's not likely to be that way in the future. We'll have to be looking at, at multi-municipalities. Um, and, and really the cities feel under the gun. They feel like they're being um, nailed because they're, as I said, less than 5% of the nutrients in our streams are from municipality discharges and ind industry discharges. Um, our big industry, Matt, is, um, you know, our big contributors are the livestock processing facilities and ethanol plants. But um, many of those have their own discharge permit. And again, they're free. We don't have many examples of this, but they're free to work with landowners in their um, jurisdiction and watershed to, to actually offset this too. But we don't have good examples yet of that happening. Um, in our case, it's, it's all agriculture. The non-point source is the major contributor to the nutrients and, and there's actually some, you know, relatively minor actions farmers can take and landowners can take to really dramatically reduce the amount of nutrients leaving their farm. Matt, anything you'd like to comment on kind of that, um, about the conception of water quality trading and how, how it's approached and, and framed in Wisconsin? Well, I, you know, at this point, we largely have had to sell water quality trading as a permanent solution for these wastewater plants to put, put their, you know, their money in, into, into it. A uh, permanent solution for nutri nutrients. Now, yeah, you mentioned other pollutants, other regulations that come up. Uh, yeah, like we said, trading's not going to do it for PFAS. So um, part of it too is the municipal debt cycle. Um, you know, if if you if your community just built a new wastewater plant and then the phosphorus regs kicked in, you're much less likely to want to overhaul than if you have an ailing facility, and it's about time to make that upgrade, right? So so that cost benefit. Um, equation will, will be very different for different communities. Um, it, it, I, I would think over time more facilities are going to tertiary filtration. We, we have 50 facilities in the state that are, are moving to tertiary filtration um, to, uh, to, to meet their phosphorus requirements and, and it'll help with other pollutants as well. So, um, and, and on the regu regulatory equity side of things, I mean, yeah, this, this issue highlights how our communities that are, you know, regulated dischargers in the business of treating wastewater are, you know, the first to see these effects of nutrient regulation. It, you know, over time, what, what do we do with our non-point sources that are less regulated? I, you know, I think that is the big question on everyone's mind. It, you know, is, is there some sort of a way to make a land ethic mandatory or somewhat mandatory? That, that is a very tough nut to crack. Oh, we just had a couple more questions come in, but I do know that it is 2.59. So I'm gonna, uh, I won't have time for them, unfortunately. We have, I think, 30 questions still in the chat from folks. This is a topic that's getting a lot of um, folks interested and, and wanting to discuss. And I think it's because there is just a, such a kind of um, different ways to go about it. It's a complex topic, as well as a topic that not everyone is intimately fam familiar with. So a lot of it, information is needed on this. So uh, Matt and Todd, I appreciate you taking the time to 
at least uh, start to um, cover that with folks and um, answer some of those questions, those questions we were able to get to. Um, I will post the recording of this webinar on our website as well as their presentation slides. So thank you, Matt and, and Todd for that. And I'm also posting their, their emails here um, as well. I know there were some folks that were answering in the chat you know, providing um, additional information on other folks' questions. So if you had a burning question you weren't able to get answered today, you could reach out to our speakers individually or to anyone else on the call that was providing some information. Thanks, Matt, for, for offering that. Um, I know there's a lot of information about this, so I'm glad we could at least cover it. I know we weren't able to cover everything, though. So um, uh, please, um, you know, go through that chat and look for those links. Um, if anyone has questions or, you know, wanted to have um, access to those links afterwards, feel free to email me directly. Um, that's, um, that's most of the information we have today. So really thank you to, to Matt and Todd for that. I do want to let folks know that we do have an upcoming webinar from our soil health team next week. We're actually going to be going over to Washington to um, the Pacific Northwest and talking about the soil health assessment across Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, Washington, excuse me, the other UW um, across Washington. That's next Wednesday at the same time, July 19th at 2 p.m. Central. And you can find that information on soilhealthnexus.org. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.